The Venezuelan Amazon is home to one of the last relatively unacculturated indigenous tribes in the world, the Yanomami Indians. Increased contacts over the past 25 years with the outside world has dramatically impacted these Indians. In November of 2000, the Venezuelan government closed Yanomami lands to outsiders as a result of controversy surrounding past interactions of scientists and anthropologists with the Indians. Historically, the Yanomami lived as hunter-gatherers in the highland forests with few possessions. What limited steel goods they had were obtained from other Indian groups who traded with outsiders since the days of the earliest explorers and colonial settlers. During the 1950s, coveted items such as machetes, axes, metal pots and fish hooks were brought by missionaries who established outposts along the navigable sections of the upper Orinoco River. The Indians migrated towards these outposts for access to these items. Migration continued and contact with the outside world increased as other missionaries, anthropologists, miners, military, and other government workers used canoes with outboard motors to reach the Indians more effectively. Many Yanomami learned Spanish as a result of these contacts. From outsiders they obtained more goods, beads, sugar, clothes and guns. They also got new diseases. By 1990, the Amazon gold rush brought miners and along with them more guns, alcohol, money, river pollution, prostitution, and more diseases. River traffic continues to bring the Yanomami who live along navigable waterways, increasing contact with the outside world, despite government efforts to limit contacts. Supply boats and motorized canoes carrying merchants, military and government workers, local residents and gold miners are routinely encountered, exposing the Indians to new ways of life and to new illnesses. In the Yanomami culture, bad spirits cause diseases. This hallucinogen ceremony has been passed down from generation to generation as a way to heal the sick and communicate with the spirit world. The headman's son has a fever and the bad spirits need purging. An initial wave of nausea and retching gives way to a drug-induced state. Only the men are allowed to participate in this ritual where a hallucinogenic powder, ebini, is blown up their noses. <laughs> While the men practice their old form of medicine, the women practice traditions of their own, spinning wild cotton, talking, tending to children, and grooming lice from their hair. These Indians live along a navigable river with routine contacts with the outside world. They are undergoing rapid acculturation and straddle two worlds.
One, of ancient traditions where bad spirits cause sickness. The other, a world of modern man with new diseases and powerful medicines. They chant to the spirit world for healing and ask for aspirina to give to the baby. A controversy has swarmed the world of anthropology with the release of a new book, Darkness in El Dorado, by Patrick Tierney, who claims that anthropologists have misrepresented the Yanomami Indians, the last large tribe of hunter-gatherers in the world, for their own gain. Yanomami men have historically been depicted as fierce warriors in anthropology books and films battling among themselves and their neighbors for women and goods. These Indians say they do not want to participate in wars or killings. They just want to live in peace and feed their families. Over the past 25 years, Yanomami have migrated from remote highland regions to more populated lowland river areas to have more access to material goods. They are adapting to new ways of life. They have crude gardens of manioc, yucca, and plantains, but for the most part are hunter-gatherers, living off the resources of the forest. The Yanomami did not develop more advanced gardening skills like many other Indian tribes. Intensive gardening is incompatible with their semi-nomadic lifestyle. This anteater, killed the night before, is a rare treat for the Yanomami. In the past, wild game was abundant and served as their main source of protein. Simple spears, bows and arrows were used for hunting. Now, encroaching civilization, the increasing use of guns and overhunting has drastically reduced the numbers of forest animals. The Yanomami are killing animals, not only for their own consumption, but also for the gold mining camps, in exchange for goods like axes, machetes, and sometimes outboard engines and guns, highly coveted items. With the help of Juan Carlos, our translator and guide, the headman of this Yanomami village compares his life with those of his ancestors. He said that when the, it's different because uh, before, when his grandpa time, they got a lot of animals but in the forest, you know, like a tapirs, crocodiles. Um, no cocodrile because we don't have a cocodrile. Caimans, uh, lapa, um, white pig. And now they got a few. Uh -huh. You know? Cayman, a member of the crocodile family, were once numerous and another regular source of protein. Their numbers too have drastically decreased. In the past, Fish were not a regular part of the Yanomami diet. Smaller highland streams and rivers did not produce large fish, and they were not preferred eating over wild game. When the highland Yanomami moved closer to navigable rivers for better access to metal tools and goods, fishing displaced hunting as a major source of protein. 
Metal hooks and nylon fish line are obtained through barter or as gifts. Piranha grow large in the river. Contrary to popular belief, it is safe to swim in the same waters, despite their sharp teeth. Fishing is now a daily ritual in this village. As a way to obtain more goods, fish are preserved by smoking and used as barter. More and more, the rivers are playing a central role in the lives of the Yanomami. The quest for goods and migration to the lowlands have affected the old ways of life for the Yanomami Indians. As interactions with the modern world increase, they are acculturated, rapidly becoming a part of it. The term hunter-gatherers may soon no longer apply to a new generation of Yanomami who now inhabit the larger waterways. The Yanomami Indians of the Venezuelan Amazon are changing. Historically, Indians from the highlands knew little about canoes. Now even the youngest members of this lowland tribe handle the flat-bottom boats with confidence. They interact with the modern world and are adapting to its ways. They are changing, giving up their ancient hunter-gatherer traditions in the process. The Yanomami are one of the last relatively unacculturated indigenous tribes in the world. In the past, they lived in the remote highland forests and made what they needed. Now they've migrated to larger waterways for access to new goods, manufactured items. As they interact with the modern world along the river, they are learning about many new things. As a way to determine his knowledge of modern goods, the tribe's headman is interviewed with the help of our guide Juan Carlos. The headman identifies items he recognizes in a picture dictionary of the industrialized world. While he calls a spoon a small canoe paddle and doesn't recognize a bed, he does recognize numerous forms of transportation, including airplanes, boats, and trucks. Uh, has, has Tomas watched television? He doesn't recognize a telephone, but he knows about television from his visits to a nearby town. What, what did he like about watching television? Was it Ketchup and a Coca-Cola bottle in their huts are evidence of previous interaction with the Western world. In the past, fibrous plants obtained from surrounding forests were used to make their hammocks. Now colorful synthetics are the fibers of choice. Metal and plastic containers are preferred for their daily chores, replacing clay pottery that they made in the past. These goods are frequently obtained in trade, as gifts and sometimes purchased. They are changing the way the Yanomami live. Our guide Juan Carlos lived nine months with a group of Yanomami. He has interacted with these Indians over the last 20 years and has observed changes in their lives. You know, I tell you, I, I tell you a history. A lot of years ago, one mayor gave me one engine to one village. I remember I gave you a ride, the engine in my boat. Before, the Yanomamis, they living near to the Caciquear in the Rio Rinoco. They come into the Caciquear to fishing by paddle and they don't know use it well, and they don't mix the gasoline with oil, and the motor was broken. One time I come, when I come back, they tell me the motor is broken. So you say you can take into Puerto Ayacucho to fix them because now we cannot go for fishing. So 
He cannot go for fishing because they don't have engine, but when they don't have the engine, they go by paddle. See? Gifts from outsiders are mandatory for visiting these Indians. The headman gathers the goods for distribution. <laughs> Items like cloth, machetes, fish hooks, beads, soap, sugar and salt were appreciated gifts in the past. As the Indians have learned more of the Western world, these are not enough. The headman wants different items from future visitors, according to our guide. I want the money. I know a Yanomami, I don't need a machete. I don't use that anymore. I don't need a, uh, this thing you bring in. I need money, you know? I need gasoline, you have to bring me one engine. As they depend more on manufactured goods and incorporate money into their lives, they move further from their past traditions. But history has not been kind to Indian acculturation. Will this girl get money through traditional crafts, education, and integration, or through slave wages, prostitution, and begging? Thank you. 